rise of the flag. Pledge of allegiance to the flag of the United States of America, to the Republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice. I will now call the roll. Council Naomi Zabit. Present. Council Judith Garcia. <laughs> Council Todd Taylor. Here. Council Giovanni Recupero. Yeah. Present. Council Leo Robinson. Yeah. Council Calvin Brown. Council Damali Vido. Present. Council Belinda Vega Maldonado. Present. Council Yamir Rodriguez. Here. Council Roya Vigeneta, present. Council Enyo Lopez. Nine. Present. Two absent. The next motion, the next portion of the meeting is our public hearing. We have uh, none here. We're moving on to memoriams and celebra celebratory resolutions. I have a resolution in regards to the city of Chelsea, affirming moral obligation to protect the civil rights of the most marginalized communities in Chelsea. Chair recognizes Councilor Damali Vido. Um, Council of Agenda, I have submitted an amendment. I'm not sure if you actually, if you received it in time. We did. I would like to submit that as uh, the new resolution to amend the change since last week. Would you like to read it? Oh, yeah, sure. Just give me one second. <clears throat> I'm assuming you need a, um, a motion from me? Correct. I'd like to move to adopt unanimously under suspension if there are no objections. I'd ask for a roll call vote. Council um, Robinson is asking for a roll call vote. I'm okay with a roll call vote. Okay. I Would actually... Like to, uh, I'm, giving you, I'm giving you the option to read the, uh, the resolution yourself or if you want me to read it for you. Um, I'm, my computer is acting really funny, so maybe I'll just have you read it. Actually, okay. I have it. I have it, Councilor. My apologies. You have the floor. All right. The heck is wrong with my computer? <laughs> you know what? Read it, Roy. I'm sorry. My computer's just... Go ahead. Okay. Whereas the murders of Breonna Taylor and George Floyd have sparked outrage and protests across the country, raising the same issues as those who protested in Ferguson in 2014 and in the Los Angeles in 1992, demanding accountability, equity, and respect from our system of law enforcement. And whereas the homicide is the fourth leading cause of death of black men in the United States, and black men are 2.5 times more likely to be killed by a police officer than their non-Hispanic white counterparts with black women 1.4 more times likely to be killed by a police officer than a white woman. And whereas Congressman Ayanna Presley, MA07, has introduced a resolution titled Condemning All Acts of Police Brutality, Racial Profiling, and the Use of Excessive, Excessive and Militarized Force Throughout the Country, and whereas the Congressional Black Caucus has also submitted an act titled The Justice in Policing, Act of 2020 that mandates cultural training for all law enforcement, bans chokeholds, mandates the use of dashboard and body cameras, reforms qualified immunity, and other requirements to promote safety. And whereas protests have erupted across the country and have created civil unrest in communities in and surrounding Chelsea, including our own Black Lives Matter protest on June 7th, organized by local young people of Let It Fly Classic in the Chelsea Black community. And whereas, as public servants, it is incumbent upon the city council to stand with those demanding accountability and equal representation under the law. And whereas, George Floyd, Breonna Taylor, Philando Castile, Eric Gardner, 
Sandra Bland, Hamadou Diallo, Michael Brown, and so many more remain in the public consciousness and that their memory serves as a call to action to elected leaders and members of the public alike to hold themselves accountable to resilient yet underrepresented under communities. Now, therefore, be, be it resolved that the Chelsea City Council offers its support for pressure from Congresswoman Presley resolutions against police brutality, racial profiling, and the militarization of our police force, and the Justice in the Policing Act 2020, and echoes its call for the Department of Justice to reinstitute its role in investigating instances of police departments that violate the civil rights of our residents. And be it further resolved that the Chelsea City Council affirm its moral obligation to protect the civil rights of the most marginalized communities in Chelsea, especially our black residents, but also other people of color, LGBTQ plus individuals, people experiencing homelessness, people with disabilities and others who have historically suffered from institutional and systematic inequities that have sexually criminalized them. Signed, Damali Vito and Judith Garcia. May I speak on it, Mr. President? You have the floor. Thank you. Um, so essentially, this is obviously we are witnessing a huge shift in the world. There are mobilizations that are happening in every single state across the world and people trying to address many of the systemic inequities that exist in all of our systems. There are calls for defunding the police and looking at the way that we allow police to show up in, in the community about about the way that the inequities exist in, in local government and medical institutions. And of course, we've seen this firsthand and seeing the way that COVID has affected us. Um, being an environmental justice community, we've seen the way that we've been treated for so long. I know, Mr. President, you yourself have advocated for the noise from the airport. These are things that normally wouldn't happen in more affluent neighborhoods. And I think it's our obligation where we have a constituency that's so diverse, that consists of so many people of color and immigrants and vulnerable communities, for us to stand up and really reflect and think about the ways that it shows up here and how we as leaders can have a hand in and having some of these conversations and figure out how we can try to change uh, some of this so that because I think in many ways, Chelsea leads on, on many fronts, and I also think that there's also work left to do. So I think it's important for us to stand in solidarity. Uh, we saw what the young people, um, what, what they've been able to organize across this country, but what they did yesterday, from one day to another, they were able to organize this. There's a need for it. Um, we had hundreds of people really just calling for change. They had a list of asks. Many of those asks were reflected in the Congressional Black Caucus um, Act that was submitted today. So I, I think this is a, an opportunity for us to be on the right side of history, and I hope that my counselors could um, join me in supporting it. Thank you. I can speak. Councilor Garcia. Thank you, Mr. President. Um, first of all, it is an honor to co-sponsor this with my colleague, Damali Vidot. Um, I believe that you know, what we presence and what we witnessed yesterday was historic. It was absolutely powerful to see how youth, guided by the Chelsea Black community, were able to take over our streets. We saw neighbors who supported this movement and opportunity now as local elected officials to really have an impact in our community. We know that the conversation at the federal level is really focusing on tackling these systemic injustices that are going on and, and unfortunately that our Black brothers and sisters are experiencing firsthand. And this didn't start last week. This has been happening for years. And we have the opportunity right now not to go back to normal but to build something better. And what other way than doing this here locally? I know that a wise man from Boston once said that all politics is local. And I know that some folks may think that this is too controversial, that this is something that in local council boards we should not be talking about. And I actually challenge that. I believe that this is exactly where things should be happening. And this is exactly where we have the opportunity to have the most impact in communities of color, in communities that have been underserved, 
Yesterday, we heard the testimonies, not only of our colleague, Gamali, who experienced police brutality, but also as black folks have been uh, unfortunate, unfortunate victims of, of police brutality. So um, again, I hope that my colleagues will join as well on supporting this measure and not only this resolution, but policies going forward that can really bring some systemic change to this city. Um, so I challenge everyone to because this does not end with a Facebook post or showing up to a march or a protest. This has to be continuous and it has to be constant. Thank you, Mr. President. Councilor Melinda Vega, Monado. <laughs> Good evening, councilors and community members. Um, today, I will share a statement that I have prepared in response to this resolution. First and foremost, I would like to disclose for those of you that may not already be aware, I'm the wife of a Latino Chelsea police officer. Um, as a lifelong resident of Chelsea, I am proud of our Chelsea Police Department and its values of building strong and trusting relationships with the community members. While I do believe, like many, there is room for improvement, I believe Chelsea, the Chelsea Police Department has done an incredible job th thus far. Having that said, as a Latina, I support this resolution because I stand against police brutality. I stand in solidarity with the Black Lives Matter movement, unfortunately, we live in a world where race and color matters. Racism is real. And as leaders, we need to dismantle the systems that continue to oppress us and build equitable policies for our city. We need to do what's right and just. I urge us to continue working as a united front to make real change. The peaceful protest that occurred yesterday was a prime example of what can be done if we work together to fight against systemic injustices. I'm going to get a little personal, okay? I want to live in a world where as a mother of two Latino boys, I don't have to advise them to not wear a hoodie to not place their hands on a steering wheel upon being pulled over if so police officers don't assume they are dangerous. Nor do I want to live where my five-year-old who loves his father and believes that his father's role as a police officer is to protect and keep our community safe and yet is being picked on at school for, for having a pig as the father. I hope to live in a world where everyone trusts all law enforcement without fear. Most importantly, where your life is not in danger because you're living while black. There's a lot of work to be done, and this resolution is the beginning of an imperative and essential conversation. Thank you. Councilman Cooper. As a father of his family's children and a father of a police officer, it's, I see firsthand what racism can do. And it's up to the legislators and the people themselves to change. They are the ones that need to be changed and need to be reformed. And the way to do it is. Follow the Congressman, follow the city officials, what we can. That's the only way you ever want to change it. We've been around for so long that it's very hard to get rid of. The only way people can change it is through unity, the way we're standing. We can't be against police and against blacks, but we need both. We need all, we need police to protect us, and we need more and more justice for all. So the only way for us to do that is through the legislative system. So that will be for. Reform the way it's done. Has done the meeting. If that doesn't change to the legislative system and to the people of power, how is that going to change? 
Justice in all of its forms. I believe that we need a meaningful national discourse in order to solve the problems of racial inequities in our justice system. As a practical matter, we need a justice system where communities of color have confidence in it. I grew up in Arizona, okay? Barry Goldwater was our senator, and in 1964, at his accepted speech at the Republican National Convention, he famously said, extremism in the defense of liberty is no vice. But it's the next line in that speech that's very apropos here. He said, and let me also remind you that moderation in the pursuit of justice is no virtue. Those words are true then, and they're true now. I'm all for having ongoing conversations and doing whatever needs to be done in a substantial way that forwards these goals. I am still resolved to vote against all political resolutions, especially resolutions that are to support another resolution. So I will be voting no on the resolution because I've pledged to vote no on all resolutions. But I stand, as I did yesterday with the Chelsea Black community, against racial injustice. 
Thank you. Thank you. Um, Mr. President? Yes. I don't necessarily want to say any. I don't want to speak again. I just wanted to let Councilor Robinson know that the amendment does include the Justice and Policy Act um, that Congress, the Congressional Black Caucus, did submit to me. I just wanted him to know that. Okay. Uh, well, I, 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 do, I do understand that, but I think not recognizing the chairperson from the Black Caucus, um, Karen Bass and Senator Cory Booker and Kamala Harrison and uh, Gerald Nadler, I think is a little misleading as to the resolution. I mean, singling out one, one person when it was more than one person to make this thing happen. That's all, that's my point is everybody should have got a little credit on it. My apologies, I was focusing on the content. Okay. Um, I want to start off first by saying there may have been some misunderstanding by uh, this matter being in front of us today versus last week. Um, as some may understand or may not understand, um, this was first introduced last week uh, rather late. And by late, I mean the day of the meeting. And for those who are not aware, um, our city council has a book of rules, basically. And in those rules, we uh, abide by stating that uh, any orders are have to be in uh, by the Wednesday before the meeting um, for a couple of reasons. One, it's administrative reason because we want to have, at the time, we wanted our then secretary, Lydia Coco, have enough time to be able to get all the packets together and then have our uh, city clerk, Paul Casino, put everything together and delivered in a timely fashion for all counselors to receive on Friday um, and be able to review everything with time. Um, second, and more importantly, um, it's because we do it so that there is full transparency for the public so that when we release our notice, of the agenda, all matters that will be considered and all matters that can the public can weigh in on uh, are there for them to see. So that's just a little bit. I, I want to make sure that uh, there's no sort of understanding that um, I myself was, was for or against the matter itself. Um, it was just uh, a, a policy that has been in place for a while and I was just following that. Now, and if anyone wants to talk to me about, you know, my position in that and where I am as an ally or a foe on this matter, I feel open to discuss it. Um, that being said, um, it's, I want to make sure that we have this dialogue, and I'm glad that this was brought up uh, both here and what we saw out in public. Part of the dialogue is to say, let's recognize at least what Chelsea is. And it was mentioned earlier about the work that the uh, city police is, and also where the city of Chelsea is all together. Um, there have been some calls in this discussion about the, where the resources are of funding and maybe funding away from police and maybe to other programs so that homelessness and mental illness and as such are not criminalized and, and, and treated in a different way than just to depend solely on the criminal justice program. Let's recognize that our previous city manager and our current city manager, you know, through the police department and such, created the hub network here in the city of Chelsea. And that this city council has for years funded what we will call street coordinators and that they work with the nonprofits in the city of Chelsea to try to ad address homelessness and repeat crime. So again, it's not just depending upon the police department and that this model is being, or this hub network is being used and now explored in other communities and Chelsea should be recognized for that, uh, for that work. Um, and that we're, we are different. And maybe it's because we are small and that we're able to try things 
and then other communities can see us as the test lab. But I want to recognize that. I also want to recognize it's true. There are police officers out there that have certain biases and attitudes. And the key to that is, you know, good recruitment and vetting by a police department. It goes without saying that we should give some credit to both the chief and uh, Sergeant uh, Filippo, um, Flippet, sorry, Flippet, about what we have as far as the quality of the men that we have in the city of Chelsea. And I don't think that they get enough credit for trying to weed out what potentially could be problems for our community, for our residents. And also that the one case that I can think of in the last few years where someone there was a little some police brutality, it was handed handled quickly and I think to everyone's satisfaction that individual was let go. Um, I want to say that, um, you know, as I reflect to directly to the um, black community in Chelsea that in myself, along with my colleagues, you have an ally in me. You have an ally that will stand and support these measures and I will support my colleagues with some reform and I look forward to the discussion. Um, I said a, a week ago that, you know, I abhor bullies and I will be out there to, you know, to cry out when I see it. Um, I talked about the Dee Brown in, you know, incident last time we spoke about this in our conversation. That was in Wellesley, Massachusetts. I was there going to Baptist College and I played pickup basketball, believe it or not, with Dee Brown. It was a great experience. And I remember when he got, you know, thrown to the ground for a suspected uh, bank uh, robbery. Yesterday, I happened to drive by Wellesley again. And yesterday, in the center of town at their church, they had their own Black Lives Matter rally. And it was, to me, amusing. Because, again, amusing in the sense that you saw all white people at the front of this church with their signs. And I didn't see, I could not see any blacks. I appreciate it, but it's not lost on me what happened in that community. It's not lost on me that when we talk about social injustice and what we fight for here in Chelsea, communities like that don't respond. So in my mind, your ally, the troublemaker, said, I said to myself, whenever I read anything about them fighting affordable housing, I plan to be there, I will step up and I will call them out. We need to go out and say, remember when you were having this rally, now you gotta show it. Don't just stand up on this day, do it in your legislation, show you're inclusive and such and support. Don't fight us when we need equity in this commonwealth overall. Don't just show up on this moment. I need to see real action in your parts. When, 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 the, when it comes up for affordable housing, such as that and inclusivity, that's when I want to see you step up to the plate. And I will be there to be the troublemaker when it happens. So um, with that, I will now, if there's no further comment, I would like to take the roll. None? <laughs> Councilman Naomi Zabit. Yes. Councilor Judith Garcia. Yeah. Councilor Todd Taylor. No. Councilor Giovanni Recupero. Yes. Councilor Leo Robinson. Yes. Councilor Calvin Brown. <laughs> Councilor Damali Bido. Yes. Councilor Melinda Vega Maldonado. Yes. Councilor Yamir Rodriguez. Yes. Councilor Roy of Agenda Brooks, yes. Councilor Enyo Lopez. We have eight in favor, one no, and two absent. Uh, the next order is the celebratory resolution to recognize June as the LGBTQ. Pride Month and celebrate the support of the LGBT community in Chelsea. The resolution reads, 
whereas individuals who are lesbian, gay, bisexual, transgender, and queer include individuals from all states, the District of Columbia, and in all nations of the world, including those from all faiths, races, national origin, social economic statuses, education levels, abilities, and political beliefs. And whereas LBGTQ people in the United States have made and continue to make vital contributions and transformational changes within the United States and in the world. And whereas LGBTQ people in the United States serve and have served in the United States Army, Coast Guard, Navy, Air Force, Marines, and other national service organizations honorably and with distinction and bravery. And whereas LGBTQ people in the United States have fought for equal treatment, dignity, equity, and respect and have achieved significant milestones, ensuring that future generations of LGBTQ people in the United States and in the world will enjoy a more equitable and just society. And whereas, despite experiencing marginalization and discrimination in the United States and elsewhere, LGBTQ people continue to celebrate their identities, build community, share love, and actively contribute to the United States and the nations of the world through a myriad of expressions of pride. And whereas COVID-19 has compelled organizations across the globe to cancel all large public gatherings until further notice, including pride celebrations. And whereas the Chelsea LGBTQ Coalition plans to raise the flag for the fifth year in a row in Chelsea on Saturday, June 6th at 11 a.m. in celebration of LGBTQ Pride Month. And whereas in an abundance of caution, the Chelsea LGBTQ Coalition will restrict the gathering to a cameraman from the LBGTQ Coalition and the Department of Public Works staff to hoist the flag while maintaining proper social, distance, social distancing protocols. Now, therefore, be it resolved that we, the members of the Chelsea City Council, officially recognize June as LGBTQ Month, Pride Month, and celebrate and support LGBTQ community in Chelsea and beyond. Signed, Council Damali Vido, Councilor Judith Garcia. Council Vido, you have a motion? I move to adopt unanimously under suspension. I'd just like to make a couple of brief comments. Seeing, are there any objections to a uh, this passing under suspension? Councillor Todd Taylor objects to a roll call. Oh, no, no, I'll, I'll call for a roll call. Roll call vote, yes. Okay. Uh, Council Vido. Thank you, Mr. President. Um, so on this has been going on for the past five years. Well, not the support of the LGBTQ community, but the flag raising. And so we um, had the flag raising on Saturday at 11 a.m., um, the fifth year that we've been doing it. Um, Chelsea is a very diverse community, as we were able to see yesterday. Um, and we've been able to see for the past couple of months, actually, um, that when times get hard, we really show up for one another. So I just want to make sure that we're lifting our LGBTQ community. Um, and also just often we talk about these things in silos, but I really want to highlight that, you know, all of these things intersect because even in the transgender community, um, transgender folks experience violence at heightened rates than other communities, than other groups, especially black transgender folks. So there's, there's intersectionality with all of these things. And so um, I just want to make sure to highlight that. And I want to just lift my LGBTQ community, including the coalition, for uh, holding this and, and doing it for five years in a row and thanking all the counselors that support this. So thank you. Does anybody may speak? Councilor Garcia. Thank you, Mr. President. Um, again, it is an honor to co-sponsor this resolution and really highlight the incredible work of the LGBT community here in Chelsea. Um, I love what my colleague, Councilor Vidod, mentioned. These issues um, and, and these groups really intersect, and I think it was very reflective this weekend. Not only did our LGBT community go ahead and really accommodate with the situation and, and still hold, they, they still decided to go on with the flag and do it in a virtual method, but also they showed up by the numbers on Sunday to support our black brothers and sisters. So I think there is so much power in that. 
and we need to celebrate them not only this weekend but this entire year I know pride month is this year so i invite you all to continue to show up for them either buying masks i know that the city tells you right now and, and the members of the specific coalition are selling masks for ten dollars and all proceeds go to continue to support these initiatives in, throughout our community it's so important i invite all of you to purchase a mask be as involved in, 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 as possible in any of the future initiatives of our LGBTQ community. Um, thank you again, Councilor Vido, for presenting this resolution. It's an honor to co-sponsor it, and I hope everyone votes in favor. Anyone else? Councilor Todd Taylor. So again, um, I was also happy to attend the flag raising and um, and it wasn't the first time that I'd done so. So uh, I, I, look, we're a big family in Chelsea and uh, we believe in inclusivity. And I think that goes for everybody. Of course, maybe, some, maybe not all people uh, believe in total inclusivity, but I do. Um, so, I, again, have made my pledge that whether I agree or disagree with any political uh, resolutions, I will vote no. But um, those of you in the LGBTQ community in Chelsea know my heart, and that's enough for me. Thank you. I'll now call the roll. Council Naomi Zavin. Yes. Council Judith Garcia. Yes. Councilor Todd Taylor. Councilor yes. Giovanni Recupero. Yes. Councilor Leo Robinson. Yes. Councilor Calvin Brown is absent. Councilor Damali Vidal. Yes. Councilor Melinda Vega Maldonado. Yes. Councilor Yamir Rodriguez. Yes. Councilor Roy Avellaneda votes yes. And Councilor uh, Enio Lopez votes is absent. Um, by the way, I announced that um, I received a text from Council Enio Lopez who stated that he could not make tonight's meeting. Just wanted to make my colleagues aware of that. Okay, we have uh, communications from the city manager receiving regarding the proposed budget fiscal year 2021. Enclosed, you will find my proposed fiscal budget for the year 2021. The budget funds the city expenditures of $84,541,305 and the school department expenditures of $96,513,406 for a total budget of $181,054,712. This is actually 1.17% lower than we appropriated in FY20. The total would have been even less if not for the fact the city's budget is out officially inflated this year because FY21 is one of those periodic years where we have 53 pay periods, not the typical 52. Obviously, this FY21 budget is not the one I had hoped to present to the council several months ago, but the world has changed dramatically with the COVID-19 pandemic and the consequences for the city's FY21 operations are substantial. Most significantly, this budget is out of balance by $4.9 million, a reflection of the significant loss of anticipated revenues caused by the economic impacts of COVID-19 virus. Despite the shortfall, the proposed budget does not include any reduction of the workforce or layoffs. I have been successful in renegotiating certain union contracts. In other union workforces, I have been able to procure savings through attrition. It is my strong belief that further forced reduction of our workforce would be counterproductive. And in light of the size of our deficit, any savings from layoffs would, be, would have a marginal effect and be more than offset by the negative impact on morale and const constituent services. The budget does not include any expansion of services, but it does seek to retain some of our pre previous important initiatives, including the navigators and the corresponding wraparound services, Roker's workforce contract and various summer youth jobs programs. It is in my opinion that eliminating the social services in a downtown 
would be dangerous at a time when the outlook for that business corridor is especially precarious. Likewise, the Roker and Summit Jobs Program may look to be a bit different in the COVID-19 era, but they still ensure work for the vulnerable young adults and indirectly put money into the local economy via the spending habits of those receiving a paycheck. I would argue strongly against their reduction. The FY21 budget reflects the full implementation of the new DPW Water and Sewer Department. As you will see, the city has saved more than anticipated from this transition. I enclosed a spreadsheet comparing last year's projected savings with the actual savings in FY 2021. Please note that this budget is built upon some very uncertain assumptions about state aid to the city. Specifically, it is assuming that state school aid, both to public schools and charter schools, will be level funded, eliminating all student, student opportunity act money and that unrestricted general government aid to the city will be reduced by 30%. But the Commonwealth has given no real direction to cities, towns, and school districts about these reductions, only, only ambiguous signals. If the assumption used for this budget proved dramatically inaccurate, I will need to amend this budget before the city sets its FY21 tax rate. Finally, I concede that utilizing almost $5 million in general stabilization reserves to balance the budget is hardly optimal, but these are unprecedented times. Thankfully, the city has spent the last decade or more building a, up a very healthy rainy day fund, and now it is time to use it. Naturally, you cannot sustain out of balance budgets with this level of reserves for long, but if, as hoped, this is a relatively short-lived economic recession and lasts no more than a year or two, we will have adequate resources to manage through. Finally, I have included, along with this FY21 budget, a five-year financial projection, which is also a charter requirement. I am prepared to provide a short presentation to the City Council and the school committee regarding this financial outlook in the next few I've weeks left the at the city council's convenience. My staff and I will also be available to answer questions on the FY21 budget in subcommittee. What is the wish of the committee of the council? Move to accept the uh, budget under suspension, move it to a conference and schedule a public hearing. Okay. Um, I just want to make my colleagues aware that um, I have made arrangements for us to begin budget hearing starting next week. The proposed budget hearing will be starting next Monday at five o'clock. We will go two hours and then have our regularly scheduled meeting at seven o'clock. We'll also be meeting on Tuesday from five to 8 p.m. and on Thursday from five to 8 p.m. We hopefully will have all of the uh, departments completed by then. If not, we'll move into the following week and hope to have all budget hearings finished by the end of the month and uh, have the budget approved at that time. I'm sorry, Mr. President, can you repeat the time? You said Monday at 5 and then Tuesday and Thursday at 5 as well? That's correct. 5 p.m. Monday start time, 5 p.m. Tuesday start time, and 5 p.m. Thursday start time. Thank you. I'll leave it up to the city manager to uh, give us an update on how he's going to schedule the different department heads in front of us. Okay. All right. Mr. President, I'd like to take from conference uh, three items that we can vote on this evening. I still have a couple of communications. Oh, yeah. Yes, sorry. Um, I do have an email from uh, Miller and a floor junior. Again, as uh, stated as last week, I, I appreciate that Mr. Miller or Penafor, uh, Mr. Penafor has uh, written to us, but he did not provide an address. I ask that he resubmit so that um, we can read it into the record. I have an email from uh, Heidi Lopez Romero of uh, 75 Charlotte Street. 
Hello, my name is Heidi Ro uh, Lopez Romero. I'm a voter and resident of District 4. I'm emailing the City Council to express my thoughts on Chelsea's response to the Black Lives Matter movement. In the previous City Council meeting, many of our elected officials discussed standing in solidarity with BLM and the injustice penetrated by the systemic racism. However, what was not mentioned was Chelsea Police was sent to aid Boston Police during the protests last week. I'm disappointed and saddened to hear this. The Boston police were using tactics to in inflict fear on protesters. Myself and fellow activists were there and can attest to this. Chelsea police should not be associated with this kind of behavior. And I personally do not want my tax dollars funding any violation of our rights. Lastly, there was an email that was sent from a Chelsea resident that was not read during a meeting. Her request was to allocate funds to other needs in the city instead of allocating funds to the police. I'm vocalizing my agreement with this statement. This does not mean I am against the Chelsea police. It does not discredit the community relationships they have created over the years. However, we should, create, we should consider investing in our community outside of policing. We're a city that can benefit from more funding in schools, extracurricular activities, sports, community engagement, and the list goes on. I hope the city council stands in solidarity with the movement, and like many cities across the nation, realize the investment in our community over police is greater in the long run. Thank you. We have another communication from our Grace Agosto, 75 Charmin Street, Unit 1. Hello, my name is Grace Agosto, Chelsea resident of District 4. I am contacting you because we are in a pivotal time in our society regarding racial and social injustice specifically with police brutality. I appreciate Chelsea Police for being professional, community focused and inclusive. However, there is a movement to allocate funds into communities instead of further funding the police. I hope the city of Chelsea takes this into account. Where could that money go? It could go towards building healthy communities to the health of our elders and children, to neighborhood infrastructure, to education, to childcare, to support a vibrant Chelsea community. Sincerely. That's the end of the communications. We're all moving on to unfinished business. Okay, I'd like to remove from conference uh, three items. The first actually uh, would be the outstanding uh, 103,000 that goes to D'Ambrosio Brown, $37,482.60. Stoneham and Chandler is $53,504.13. Additional $12,000 should be significant to cover the services. I can bring it to $103,000 and ask for a roll call on the adoption. Council Robinson is asking to pull out of uh, well, conference, conference, conference in the financial uh, committee on conference and finance to uh, the order for to, to pay for legal, uh, legal outside legal uh, funds for the law department. A yes vote would support the uh, move of free cash to pay this. A no vote would to state against the transfer. Anyone have any comments? Yeah. Councillor Recupero. This is the take the money and give it for Miss Bishop's apartment for litigations. This is to fund three three different um, accounts, well, three different uses. One is um, two of them are for law firms that have already provided services to the city and we're paying uh, outstanding legal fees. Another is to replenish that account, so for future um, use uh, for other uh, third party. Um, if you want, I can have the city manager just quickly explain um, what this fee. This is a matter that came up a couple of months ago, and that just now we're uh, finally had a meeting on, and we're moving forward. Okay, thank you. Anybody else? No. Okay. Uh, roll call. A yes is to transfer the legal, the uh, free cash over. A uh, no vote is to move against. Councilor Naomi Zabit. Yes. Councilor Judith Garcia. Yes. Councilor Todd Taylor. Yes. Councilor Giovanni Recupero. Yes. 
Councilor Leo Robinson. Yes. Councilor Calvin Brown, absent. Councilor Damali Vido. Yes. Councilor Melinda Vega Maldonado. Yes. Councilor Yamir Rodriguez. Yes. Councilor Roy Avignetta votes yes. Councilor Daniel Lopez, absent. So nine in favor, none against, two absent. Carries. Second uh, order is from the Chelsea Retirement Board. And it was for us to pass uh, Mass General Law 32, Chapter 1206. Now hereby be accepted of, of that order and its compensation to the members of the Chelsea Retirement Board. It's actually their money as it come from the city. It's 3,000 per year and they're going to 4,500 per year. But ask for a roll call roll on the adoption. Okay. Uh, if anyone could not hear Councilor Robinson, I'll just repeat. This was a, um, a request by the Retirement Board to allow themselves to increase their salary from 3,000 to 4,500. Uh, the, uh, in the subcommittee on the comp, uh, finance, it was explained that first and foremost, this funding comes directly out of their own uh, funds. It does not have anything to do with city funds. Uh, also that by just, there needs a vote by the city council to allow them this. A yes vote will support the increase. A no vote will retain, will keep them at the current $3,000 rate. Councilor Naomi Zabit. Yes. Councilor Judith Garcia. Yes. Councilor Todd Taylor. Yes. Councilor Giovanni Recupero. Yes. Councilor Calvin Brown is absent. Councilor Damali Vidal. Yes. Councilor Melinda Vega Maldonado. Yes. Councilor Yamir Rodriguez. Yes. Councilor Roy Avejaneda votes yes. Councilor Daniel Lopez absent. Nine in favor, none against, two absent. And the uh, last order is the CIP. And there are a bunch of the, the resolution would be uh, the capital improvement program loan order will be the last to be read. And we have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, seven different bills that relate to the CIP. Would you like to have them together or separate? Uh, if there's no objections from the council, we could take, we can, if you want to read the amounts. Okay. Then we could take them on and one roll call vote and then we'd have to do the um, capital improvement program loan on a um, separate. Okay. I'm going to read the resolution first for the CIP, the capital improvement project. The city charter requires the annual adoption of the five year capital improvement project. And the capital improvement project is an integral component of the city's financial planning and the cornerstone of our quality of life, both of which foster the economic development necessary to expand our tax base and sustain life of the community. A capital improvement program is necessary for the maintenance and improvement of the city's infrastructure, possibly only in conjunction with long-term financial planning. The capital improvement program reduces ongoing maintenance costs and the high cost of emergency repair work. In this year, 2020, we, the City Council of the City of the Chelsea, have now before us the 23rd such capital improvement program and hereby accept the submission of this capital improvement program as provided for in Section 5-4 of the City Charter. No other requirements being provided by ordinance. Adoption of the capital improvement program prior to submission of the operating budget assists the City Manager in carrying out his duties as the impact of capital budget expenditures for the oncoming fiscal year are reflected in the annual operating budget. This capital improvement program for fiscal years 2021 to 2025 25, includes projects for maintenance and improvements of city roadways, water, sewer, and drainage systems, roadways and sidewalks, transportation, public buildings and facilities, parks and open space, public safety projects, and general equipment. In accordance with 5-C of the City Charter, a public hearing was held on March 23rd, 2020. Prior, prop, prior properly left, say that five times fast. Prior public notice has been properly given. The City Council will ha having reviewed Chelsea's Capital Improvement Program 2021-2025 recognizes the hard work and continued effort 
put into this document by city's officials and does hereby adopt this program. That's the resolution. I'm going to ask for a roll call vote. Oh, I'm sorry. Council Leo Robinson is asking for a roll call vote. We'll vote, we'll vote on that last. We have, we have the bills that means that go with the, um, the CIP program loan order. So if we you want to just kind of give those numbers. Yes. So the attached is, um, we have miscellaneous grants of 4,980,000. Chapter 90 money is 596,000 for a total of 5,576,000. We have a total sum of $6 million in the general obligation funds. And we have a sum of $300,000 that's, 300, that's going to be appropriate for the pay to cost of water system improvement. We have 3,100,459 of free cash to pay for various capital improvement project purchases. And then the sum of that sum, 235,000 will be appropriated to water enterprise fund. The two, another 235,000 will be appropriated to sewer enterprise fund. And the sum of 725,000 appropriated for the school stabilization fund. We have an adopt uh, order there that the order that the treasurer is here is authorized to file an application with the appropriate officials of the Commonwealth of Massachusetts to qualify under Chapter 44A, the general laws and bonds of the city authorized pursuant to this order. Well, actually, the, the following items we would take under one, one vote, then we'll go back to the capital improvement plan. And that the uh, call is 20F60, 20F61, 20F62, 63, 64, 65, and 66. So if there are no objections, we can take those on, on the end. And that's an actual question. Hold on one second. Let me just get organized. The Beecham Street project is not part of that, correct? Or it is? It is. It is. Okay. Uh, okay. We have all those. Council Recupero, you have a question. Yes, is this a two third vote? We need eight councils to send this through? Yes, we do. Okay, thank you. Okay. So the first are the eight individual. Yes. Okay, and then afterwards we'll do the loan order. The loan order. So at first we're going to take as a bunch the eight individual orders for the amounts that I just uh wrote off or announced and then after that we will uh take a vote on the loan order itself the yes vote would approve the eight amounts that we just read a no vote would be against it councilor naomi zabbitt yes councilor judith garcia yes councilor todd taylor yes councilor giovanni recupero yes Councilor Leo Robinson. Yes. Councilor Calvin Brown is absent. Councilor Damali Bido. Yes. Councilor Melinda Vega Maldonado. Yes. Councilor Yamir Rodriguez. Yes. Councilor Roya Vejaneda votes yes. Councilor Enio Lopez is absent. We have nine in favor, zero against, and two absent. Separate these, we do that. We now have the capital improvement law program loan order. Once again, in uh, a yes vote would approve the total loan order, a no vote against it. For the record, uh, all city councils have signed on to the loan order. Correct. Councilor Naomi Zabbitt. Yes. Councilor Judith Garcia. Yes. Councilor Todd Taylor. Yes. Councilor Giovanni Recupero. Yes. Councilor Leo Robinson. Yes. Councilor Calvin Brown is absent. Councilor Damali Bido. Yes. Councilor Melinda Vega Maldonado. Yes. Councilor Yamir Rodriguez. Yes. Councilor Roya Vigneta votes yes. Councilor Enio Lopez is absent. 
Nine in favor, zero against, two absent. Okay, let me go that afterwards. Okay, I now have a order here introduced by Council Leo Robinson. Request the committee on conference to look at a zoning ordinance in regards to development. What is the wish? Uh, I thought that she did on the suspension and at some point we'll have a conference on it and be able to speak about some things that looking at the zoning changes possibly. Councillor Bidell. I have no idea what that means. Can I get a little clarity on what that order means? It's very vague. Okay, the, the order reads, request for a committee on conference to look at our zoning ordinance in regards to development. Can I ask the maker of the motion um, what what the intention is? I, I still don't, I don't think they quite get it. I want to be able to review some of the zoning and figure out if we should be making any changes to the zones. I think we have to, my own personal opinion, look at how the, how the communities have, most developers are bypassing Chelsea and going to other communities because their zoning fits to what they're looking to do. And I think it's time that we review some of our zoning and see whether or not we need to make any, any changes. Councilor Vidal, do you have a follow-up question? I guess, yeah, I object. I object to the first, I don't, I don't, I still don't understand really what we're talking about. I mean, can, can it be amended? I guess maybe I just want something a little bit more clearer. Like, it, it's so difficult for us to meet during the pandemic, and I want to make sure that when we're meeting, it's fruitful. And I don't really understand. It's, it seems rather vague. I don't get it. Okay. I mean, you can object to the first reading if you want. Yeah, let's do that. Okay. So I'll say that she pushes it to a second reading. Okay. Mm -hmm. All right, I have a late order um, submitted by Council Robinson. It uh, reads. I'd ask to move that to the next meeting. Okay, I was going to object, so. <laughs> that was the late question. Wow, I thought we were going to give late orders. He can't. He, yeah. he's, 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 he's taking it to the next meeting. Huh? He is taking it to the next meeting. Okay. I mean, so this is no one's allowed to do Late no. That's what you said earlier, right? That's correct. It's a late order, and I was going to object, but yeah. the counselor is pulling it anyway. All right. Okay. Seeing no other business, I am now moving on to, I'm sorry, new business. Uh, we have public announcements. Is there anyone that has any public announcements? Yeah. Council Judith Garcia. Yeah. Thank you, Mr. President. Um, so this is a quick announcement for the residents who are watching, as well as my colleagues who are also watching. Um, as you know, this is a very important year as uh, we have a, the president has established a special committee according to the charter and, and our our, our duty here as, as a full body, a uh, government body, we have to review the city charter, which is actually the most important legal document in our city. So uh, a, a few weeks ago, we had a kickoff meeting so the public could get a little bit more acquainted with the members of the special committee and also for our committee to establish ground rules on what we want to do going forward. So this Wednesday at 6 p.m., we, our charter will be, meet, our, our, our special committee will be meeting to review section one of the charter. So we, what we've decided is to have several meetings and in each meeting we'll, we'll be reading and discussing and reviewing our city charter. Again, it's very important to the public who's watching to understand that our only duty is to review it have recommendations for the council later on as a package. So we invite you all to uh, be a part of this process. Please submit any comments if you have any. We will be submitting our meetings live through Facebook and we will also be uh, broadcasting on CCTV, trying to make it as accessible as possible for everyone. If you have any comments that you would like to share, you can go ahead and submit those on Tuesdays by noon. So we give you ample room. We, we're actually meeting every every two weeks. So every Wednesday, every two weeks on Wednesdays at 6 p.m., we're accepting comments 
on Tuesday by noon. So whatever Tuesday you want to send it, just send it to us. Just make sure it's by noon p.m. So we invite you all. We will be on Facebook Live. We have promoted this on Facebook, and we will also be promoting on our city website and looking to expand that promotion as well. So this Wednesday at 6 p.m., uh, feel free to tune in as we review Section 1. Thank you. Councilman Vito. Thank you, Mr. President. Um, I know that we referenced it a couple of times, but I just really want to thank the young people that organized the Black Lives Matter protest yesterday, um, hosted by the Let It Fly uh, Classic Basketball Tournament and Chelsea Black Community. It was a beautiful showing. Um, of, it was a beautiful showing of community, extremely diverse. We saw teachers, police officers, uh, librarians, and and construction workers and people from all walks of life just coming together, um, standing in solidarity against systemic injustice. It was completely uh, led by, by the young people. I was honored that they chose me. They said that they didn't want it to be too political, but I was honored that they did cho choose me to be their voice and to speak. Um, maybe some people don't look at me like a politician, and that makes me extremely happy. Um, so I was, I was grateful that they had chosen me, but I was really proud of what they were able to organize in only in just a matter of like two days. They decided they wanted to do this on Friday, and by Sunday we had hundreds and hundreds of people coming together. Um, I think that, you know, a lot of times when these things happen in the, in the, in the world, uh, people get a little handicapped. They don't know how to respond because it's been so traumatic for so many of us, um, that I think it was a nice outlet for everyone to channel their energy and come together um, for one common cause. So I just really wanted to lift the work, uh, specifically Jade and Kyle Umemba, for uh, hosting this, and all the other young people that were working behind the scenes to make it happen. Thank you. Council Recupero. Okay, my public announcement is this. The people that want to go to the Charter Review Committee are not able to go. So the Charter Review Committee shouldn't be allowed the way it's set up now because the people that can't go and don't have this access to it are not allowed to it. So it should be null and void. It should be carried on until it could be the regular process where people can come and voice their opinion. Because through Facebook and the others, they cannot face it. So whatever they do here is really not the way it's supposed to be done. You could delay the process. There's nothing to say, because I was here once before. The Charter Committee, it took two years later before it came back. So there's not a privilege to do it right now. Right now is the wrong time to do it, because people don't have access. About the people that don't have access. About people, you want the people to have an input in it. In this way, people don't have an input. I have a question. Councilor Robinson. Do we have any plans on when we're going to be returning to City Hall? Um, the question uh, is raised to me about uh, when we were getting getting back to City Hall, when they might have a semblance of uh, normalcy of public meetings. Um, I think that given what the governor is doing and allowing steps by steps, the uh, we're now allowing restaurants to open outdoors and I expect that if there's no regression that within four weeks uh, public gatherings will then start I fully expect that we possibly would be back after our summer break in September to have our regular gatherings and to the point raised by um, a few Councilor Recupero First and foremost, let us remind everyone at home and my colleagues that we are mandated by the Charter to have to do the review at this point in time, in the every year ending in zero. So yes, we have to do it. Now, the fact remains, this process could last all the way to December. I think that between now and December, we will probably have several meetings that the public will come will be able to meet in what we would call normal circumstances. So I can't expect that we hope that school will start come September. And if we're allowing kids to be in school, we probably can allow adults to come up here to City Hall and 
go to regularly scheduled meetings, whether it be the planning board, charter review board, city council board, and such. So I think we all see the little increment, incremental uh, steps that we're taking, but I'll allow city manager to, um, you know, say, state his opinion because he's in regular contact with the governor and they just started to allow city hall to be open. So he may have some um, idea when we may have some sense of normalcy here. Um, City Manager Tom Brazina, would you like to address that portion? So this really is up to the discretion of the uh, city council. You could open up the city council chambers now. It's we would be the, the one requirement we would be limited to is the occupancy requirement of the building and the occupancy requirement that we set for that. Uh, Council chamber still allows for up to 66 people. We would have to set it up in a way that people could be physically distant. So we would do what you see in houses of worship now, where sort of every other bench is, is corded off with police tape. And so you're only sitting on every other bench, and there's tape on the benches to show people where to sit. So you could create in that chamber right now the ability to. Uh, have a meeting in there and you the, I would suggest that you wouldn't want to be at your uh, dais because that's not six feet apart so you have to figure out a way to uh, position yourselves in there that would allow for six feet of distance I guess this is a long-winded way of saying you really could do it anytime you want although I would suggest that there you know unless there's a pressing need for people to be here in the next month I think waiting till the end of this month is probably a good idea. I think once the governor moves to his phase three, that's when there's a lot more uh, confidence that you can bring people together. So just as I've advised houses of worship to delay until the end of this month, even though they got to go ahead, you know, three weeks ago to open, I would say the same to you. If, I, if you were being prudent, I probably suggest, even though you could be in that chamber, to wait at least until the end of the month. I think that would be better. And unfortunately for you, the end of the month means your meetings are over for the summer. So as a practical matter, you might be looking at something. But there's nothing that prohibits you from doing it. I would, but if you're asking me my recommendation, I would give you the same recommendation I gave houses of worship, not all of whom listened to me, which was, why don't you wait till the end of June? And cool. again, that, that also means that the, the, the chair for the charter committee could have meetings during the summer and could have meetings in council chambers um, and open it to the public at some point in July and August. Just because the city council is in recess does not mean that you guys get to take a vacation. <laughs> council Vido, you're free I, to go. I, I really want to talk a, a little bit more about this, um, what, what Councilor Recupero brought up about accessibility. Um, I was trying to attend a meeting last week and I couldn't be accommodated um, because we were in executive session. And while I understand that, I think that you know, we have to be mindful of people that just have health problems and are not able to show up. I think that these are unprecedented times and none of us thought that we would be in the middle of a pandemic. But though some of the more healthier folks might be able to go to meetings at the end of the month, that might not apply for all of us. I am auto-compromised. I suffer from sarcoidosis, a very severe autoimmune disorder, and it would pose it would be a threat to my life if I were to be exposed. So I just want to make sure that as we move forward, if you guys do decide that you want to go back before the four phases or before doctors have cleared um, other counselors, that we we reevaluate what being present means and that someone like me who does have a documented disability would be able to be accommodated to make sure that I can participate because I was elected just like everyone else and I shouldn't be treated any different because of my health. Thank you. Totally noted. Anybody else have any announcements? Uh, my, own, my only concern is when we, uh, when we do the budget that we have a public hearing and 
you know, how we're going to deal with that. We're just going to have people send in comments, or we're going to actually have people come to the city hall to voice their concerns. We will work with something um, on a limited basis, have people come up to City Hall and wait in that area. And when they need to speak, they can one by one come here and talk to us and approach us. That's my that's going to be my attempt next week. We're going to work it out on a test drive and then see how it goes. I have a Councilor Recupero is going to ask for a moment of silence. Go ahead, speak the name. Uh, for the, uh, the gentleman's name is Joey Nassimento. He grew up on Central Island. Last week, he was found dead in uh, New Hampshire. And he was a child. He from Chelsea. His whole family still here. He grew up here. And I'm sure that many people his age, I think he was like 47 years old, would know who he is. Young Joe. Anyone else? Okay, we all rise for a moment of silence. I'm sorry, I just want to add all the uh, victims that have died as a result of all these movement protests. Okay, that ends this meeting. Thank you very much, everyone. Good night, counselors.